plants in Mississippi. And I'd like to go ahead and get started just talking about what we mean when we talk about invasive plants. We, uh, we hear that word a lot. It, it can be used in a few different ways. Uh, but when I use the term invasive, I'm, I'm really referring fairly narrowly to plants that are not native to here in Mississippi. Uh, and of course, uh, they're, they're plants that we tend to think of as weeds. Uh, if you go and ask a weed scientist, a, a weed is a plant out of place. Uh, but a lot of these plants can be really damaging uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, either they're damaging in terms of crowding out some of our native species. Uh, they may have some other qualities that make them problematic. And uh, so we, we really want to be careful about them. And, and you know, I'm going to specifically talk more about invasive plants in the home landscape today. Uh, rather than, than more broadly if we're talking about invasive plants in forestry or agriculture or other areas like that. Uh, but there are some specific qualities of plants that make them more prone to be invasive. And a lot of that really just comes down to that plant being able to rapidly reproduce in a variety of different ways. Often these plants that are invasive will reproduce very quickly by seed. Uh, oftentimes the seed can be dispersed in a number of different ways, uh, either by animals feeding on the plant and then dispersing those seeds, uh, or potentially as well by weather or by the movement of water. Uh, and oftentimes the, these plants that become invasive can not only reproduce by seed, but also reproduce vegetatively. And we, we talked about a little bit about that when we were talking about plant propagation, but a lot of plants are able, particularly some of the grasses, uh, can reproduce from small sections of the plant that get distributed in just a whole bunch of different ways, uh, often unfortunately by human action uh, as we have machinery or tools that might spread that plant around. Uh, some other qualities that, that invasive plants tend to have uh, is that they tend to flower and fruit for a long period of time. That just makes them a lot more uh, able to spread. They're just to have more opportunities. Um, they, they tend to be adapted to a wide range of conditions, so they can tolerate wet soils and dry soils, acidic soils and alkaline soils. Uh, they don't tend to have a, a lot of difficulty germinating, uh, and oftentimes they're really going to be, you know, particularly grow quickly and be very comp uh, competitive with some of our native species. Uh, one of the terms that I'll use is I'll refer to some plants as being early secessional species. Uh, and when we're talking about that, what we mean is a plant that is going to establish in an area after it's cleared or after there's some disruption. It's one of the first plants that tend to show up. Uh, and if it can make use of that area very quickly, it can kind of crowd out the other species that would use that area. Uh, another quality that can be uh, particularly frustrating with invasive species is often they are quite difficult to control. Uh, a lot of that being down to some of the qualities that we've already mentioned. So uh, we want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the different uh, weeds that we deal with here in Mississippi. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have the time today to discuss all of these, uh, but this is a partial list of Mississippi's noxious weeds. Uh, these are weeds that are sort of regulated by the state. Uh, and considered by the state to be very serious issues uh, that we need to take, uh, take care of. Uh, the weed that I'm probably going to spend the most time on today is going to be Kogan grass. Uh, you can see that up there at the top of the list. I'll also talk about the Chinese tallow tree or popcorn tree. Uh, that has gotten a, a lot more attention more recently. I'm uh, also going to talk about kudzu. It's probably the most famous invasive plant uh, that we deal with. And uh, then I'm going to talk about one that's not on this list uh, because it's one that tends to be a, a really common issue 
uh, for gardeners, and it's one that I certainly have to deal with a lot as I am building gardens. Uh, so to start off talking about Kogan grass, uh, we can uh, give it its formal name of Imperata cylindrica, uh, or we can refer to it by its common names. Kogan grass is going to be the one that you hear most often, uh, but you may also occasionally hear it referred to as spear grass or Japanese blood grass. And it gets that name, uh, that the blood grass name, because uh, the uh, uh, the blades of the lean, the blades of the grass uh, can have a, kind of a, a really distinct reddish color. Uh, but uh, you can see some images of Kogan grass there uh, on this slide. Uh, one, as we see it in its its non-reproductive stage, it doesn't have any flower heads. Uh, but you can see that uh, relatively tall grass up along that hedgerow or, or fence row. Uh, and the way I very commonly see it is as that patch that's uh, in the middle of the roadway. Uh, and as you're driving down the road, it's fairly likely uh, that you have seen these patches of Kogan grass that are really distinctive, particularly when they're blooming. Uh, Kogan grass can spread both by seed and vegetatively. Uh, it produces a lot of rhizome. Uh, those rhizomes are, are stems that grow uh, right along the ground or right underneath the soil. Uh, and each of those rhizomes is capable of rooting at every individual node uh, and essentially producing a whole new infestation of that Kogan grass, which makes it very easy to spread from place to place. And while those rhizomes are dormant during the winter, uh, once spring comes along, they will uh, be able to, to grow and to produce those new plants. Uh, Kogan grass is native to Asia uh, worldwide. It covers about 500 million acres uh, and can be found on every continent except Antarctica. And I suspect if there were any soil in Antarctica that wasn't covered by uh, ice, we might find it there as well. Uh, it tends to prefer uh, subtropical and tropical regions, there's less spread into cooler areas of the world. Uh, and it's listed as the seventh worst weed in the world. Uh, so it is a, a nasty one to deal with. Uh, you can see on the, the picture here, uh, that large sword of Kogan grass uh, that really just takes over a field. Uh, there are several fields near where I live. Uh, that, that are, are not really managed, and you can just see Kogan grass really as far as the eye can see. Uh, the map that you see there on the left uh, kind of shows the states where Kogan grass is a, a problem, uh, and so really the entirety of the southeastern United States uh, has been infested with Kogan grass, uh, and particularly for Mississippi, it, it's found in every county. Now, Kogan grass was introduced into the United States a couple of different times. Uh, it was introduced into Mobile and into Mississippi uh, in the uh, 19-teens, 1920s, uh, and into Florida in the 1930s. Uh, a lot of this was uh, an attempt to use Kogan grass as a forage crop or as erosion control. Uh, it's not particularly good as a forage for cattle, uh, didn't perform as well, and cattle don't tend to like it. Uh, a large part of that being due to uh, the fact that it has a, a lot of silicates in it, make it very rough, uh, has rough edges, and it's, it's quite unpleasant. Uh, another way that Kogan grass gets introduced into the United States, or was introduced into the United States, is as an ornamental grass. Uh, you can see a picture there. Uh, in a, uh, uh, a, a, a seed guide or a, a plant guide uh, talking about all the, the nice color that you get with it. Uh, and you can see it there planted in front of a house where it's just taken over the entire front of the landscaping. Uh, and, and while it certainly can have some, uh, uh, some really nice color, unfortunately, a lot of times that color just goes away after a little while. Uh, and you wind up with these stands of just kind of a, a really difficult to control grass, but planting by homeowners uh, and planting by uh, as an ornamental grass 
uh, really is just another way that it was introduced into the United States and began to spread. Uh, Kogan grass is relatively simple to identify. Uh, the leaves of the grass or the blades of the grass can be quite tall, uh, as tall as six foot. Um, the, uh, they don't have a, a big stalk of grass. Uh, the leaves arise really close to the ground. Uh, tend to be about a fifth to an inch, uh, uh, a fifth to a one inch wide. Uh, the easiest way that I have found in order to identify Kogan grass uh, is looking at its midrib. So if you see the picture there, uh, when you think about that midrib on a, a grass blade, we, we normally think about that being right down the center of the blade. In Kogan grass, it's canted over to one side, uh, really prominent, and where you see it kind of over that one, you know, one third of the blade on one side and two thirds on the other, uh, that is a, a really good sign that what you're dealing with is Kogan grass. Uh, another thing that you can do just if you run your hand along the Kogan grass, it's going to feel really rough. Uh, those edges are serrated. Uh, be careful when you do that. I've, I've done that as a demonstration for people a few times uh, and uh, left a little paper cut on my hand doing that. Uh, it tends to have kind of a yellowish green color. Um, and uh, and is, But I really think that the easiest way to look for it uh, is looking at that midrib, I think that's a really easy way to identify the grass. Of course, one of the other ways that we can identify Kogan grass is by its flowering. Uh, Kogan grass is a little unusual in terms of how it flowers because it tends to flower at the beginning of the growing season, uh, whereas a lot of the native grasses that we have that might kind of look like Kogan grass tend to flower at the end of the growing season. So uh, that grass we see flowering in March into May, kind of dependent on where you are, uh, is, is very likely to be stands of Kogan uh, grass. Uh, though it's important to, to understand that if it's disturbed uh, by mowing or frost or uh, fire or tilling or any other soil disturbance like that, uh, it may flower in response to that as well. Uh, and the flowers are really distinctive, uh, kind of have a silvery or white silky hair uh, that's attached to the seed that gives us that really feathery plume. Uh, you can see a picture of that there. Uh, really stands out. You can see it from quite a distance away. Uh, those plumes go anywhere from two to eight inches. Uh, kind of have a, a, a cylindrical shape to them. Uh, and again, those are usually going to show up from about March into May. Uh, you can see an even better picture really there uh, of all of those plumes. That's a much larger stand of Kogan grass. Uh, you can see all of those uh, all of those plumes out there in that field, uh, right around all those trees. Um, and each Kogan grass plant can produce about 3,000 seeds in a season. Uh, those are uh, frequently, we're going to see them at open sites. Uh, if you've uh, disturbed an area or if it's been cut or burned or tilled or graded, um, and the seedlings can begin to produce rhizomes and really settle in uh, about four weeks after they emerge. They can set up in an area very, very quickly. Uh, one of the things that makes Kogan grass very easy to disperse is that those plumes uh, all of that white silky material that's attached to the seed uh, really helps it pick, get picked up by the wind and dispersed. Uh, of course, it can be carried by vehicles or other objects. <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, reasons why we often see it along roadways uh, is that if you've ever stood by an interstate or stood by a highway, you know how much wind those moving vehicles can produce. Uh, and so the winds from all those vehicles traveling along highways uh, can actually aid the dispersal and the movement of Kogan grass from place to place. Uh, of course, all of the, uh, the rhizomes as well can be carried in soil or on equipment, and so that's something that you want to pay attention to also. Uh, Kogan grass is widely adapted to a range of different areas. It, it likes acidic soils. Uh, it will grow in both sandy and clay soils. It prefers a subtropical or tropical climate. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about fraught fire dependence there here in just a second. Uh, but the real, comp the real thing to pay attention to here uh, is just that there's a, a lot of similarities between uh, what Kogan grass or the, the types of environments that Kogan grass grows well in and the type of environment that we have here in Mississippi uh, and really the surrounding states as well. Uh, I mentioned that uh, we talked about uh, fire dependent ecosystems. Um, and in, you'll see that a lot in, uh, certainly in pine forests, uh, and it is natural that pine forests burn every so often to kind of clear out all the underbrush uh, and make the trees grow a lot better. Uh, and Kogan grass really thrives in that environment, uh, and it allows uh, those fires to go on a little bit more than we would like them to. Uh, Kogan grass burns very hot. Uh, and uh, so you can see a comparison there that uh, in invaded sites that have Kogan grass, uh, that fire can burn about 250 degrees Fahrenheit hotter uh, than you would see in an uninvaded site. And that can really be damaging to some, uh, some forestry uh, because those temperatures just get too hot. Uh, it can also make those fires uh, grow, go very, very quickly. Uh, start to talk a little bit about how to manage Kogan grass. Uh, one thing that can work is mowing. Uh, so mowing can help to re reduce the stands, but you have to really mow them frequently and mow them at a low height. Uh, so we really want to just knock them down as much as we possibly can. Um, and herbicides are going to be an essential Part of dealing with, uh, with Kogan grass. We'll mention that here in just a second. Uh, one thing that's really important when we talk about mowing Kogan grass, uh, you can see that picture there in the, the top where they're we're cutting down a large field, uh, and you can see all of those plumes of seed there on those stalks of Kogan grass or you know, on that Kogan grass. Um, I would be very cautious mowing, a, uh, mowing Kogan grass when you have those seed heads. Um, because inevitably some of those seeds are going to get onto the, the, onto the mower or, or actually be dispersed when, uh, when you're mowing. Uh, so ideally when we, we want to keep that uh, Kogan grass knocked down, uh, prevent it from ever being able to put up those seed heads, uh, and just continually mow it as often as possible in order to just prevent it from being able to put up blades. Uh, those blades are how that plant is collecting energy. Uh, and so we're just wanting to interrupt that as much as we possibly can. Uh, after it's been uh, mowed down, we are going to want to use herbicides, uh, just spot treatment. Uh, and we'll talk about, again, we'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, in areas where it's possible, tillage has been used as a method of controlling uh, cooking grass. Uh, you can till down to, to six, eight inches uh, and just continually till that area. Um, again, being very careful about distributing any Kogan grass rhizomes, uh, being sure to clean that equipment. Uh, of course, in a, in a lot of home landscapes, that's not really possible. Uh, so uh, mowing and herbicides are the controls we need to use. Uh, so if we have small areas, uh, you know, kind of aiming at, at less than a 20 foot diameter, uh, we can treat those uh, with glyphosate a uh, bunch of different train names, but uh, what most people think of is Roundup. Uh, we want to treat those in the early fall from about August through October. Uh, and most formulations of Roundup are, are going to have labels for this. Uh, but for a 4% solution, if you, if you buy the, the strong uh, Roundup that's out there on the market or glyphosate that's out, out there on the market, uh, you're going to be adding five and a third fluid ounces of that to a gallon of water. Uh, spray that, and that will kill back that top growth of that Kogan grass. Uh, trick is we will wind up with regrowth of that Kogan grass. The rhizome has a lot of energy stored up, uh, and it is very stubborn. Uh, so uh, in the following spring, as we see that Kogan grass start to come back, we want to go back and spray it again in order to, again, just knock that down, kill that top growth, prevent it from being able to, uh, to put up any, uh, any solar panels to get that energy. 
And it, it's quite possible that we're going to have to go back in the fall again uh, in order to actually get effective control uh, of the plants and just run those rhizomes completely out of energy. Another thing that's really important when we're controlling cooking grass is that we want to not only knock down the grass in that area, we want to come back with something that's going to cover in that area and sort of fill in that space. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have a replacement species planted in that area following that last treatment, uh, either the spring or second fall after we've actually got effective control. Uh, you can go back in, uh, you know, either with crimson clover or ryegrass, uh, and you know, after you've applied glyphosate, uh, glyphosate doesn't retain any uh, any activity in the soil uh, after about a day or so. Uh, so you can go back in there and apply that clover or ryegrass, and that will fill in that area and prevent and just sort of outcompete the cooking grass from being able to come back. Uh, after all of that, you can replace the cover crop, the uh, ryegrass or clover, uh, with a perennial grass, uh, whatever grass you're, you're growing in your landscape, uh, or some shrubs that are planted that are really going to give you a good density uh, where you have good canopy closure of those shrubs to just provide and sort of shade out and again compete out that cogan grass. All right, so that was uh, cogan grass. Uh, the other invasive plant that, that really gets a lot of attention and uh, has, has uh, sort of been in the consciousness recently uh, is the Chinese tallow tree or popcorn tree. Uh, Chinese tallow is a deciduous tree, uh, has a milky sap. Uh, they generally grow to about 30 feet tall. Uh, I have seen some popcorn trees that are quite a bit larger than that. Uh, just uh, growing in a site that's particularly good for them. Uh, I frequently see uh, popcorn trees in people's yards being used as shade trees and all sorts of other things. Uh, they have small yellow flowers they have, that are on spikes about eight inches long. Uh, probably the most distinctive thing about them is their fruit. Uh, we see these in the fall uh, and uh, the fruit's about a half inch wide. Uh, and it opens up to reveal those sort of three dull white seeds. Uh, that's where the, the plant gets its, its other common name of popcorn tree, um, because those really do look a lot like popcorn. And uh, oftentimes we'll see the plant retain those seeds throughout the winter. Uh, the wildlife will disperse them, uh, birds will move them around. Uh, they're really not good as a food source for birds. Uh, but they will give it a shot and wind up moving the seeds around. Um, Chinese tallow tree has kind of an interesting history as far as its introduction into the United States. Uh, it was brought in prior to the 1800s. We don't know the exact date. Uh, we do have a letter written by none other than Benjamin Franklin in, in 1772 uh, to a friend of his in the Georgia colony, a Dr. Noble Wimberly Jones. Uh, and he wrote, I send also a few seeds of the tallow, uh, Chinese tallow tree, which I believe uh, will grow and thrive with you. It is a most useful plant. Um, so uh, it, it's been spreading here in the Southeast United States for, for quite a very long time. It was described in 1803 uh, by botanists. Uh, and it has been introduced repeatedly uh, as both an ornamental plant and as a potential oil crop. Um, it is again an early secessional species. It tends to come into areas that have been disturbed. It grows very quickly. Uh, and as a result of its presence, uh, the number and variety of different native species we have in an area can, can really be reduced. Uh, it really alters that ecosystem a lot. It can tolerate a, a extraordinarily wide range of different environmental conditions. Uh, it can be seen growing in brackish water. Uh, it can tolerate water flooding. It'll grow in the shade or full sun. Uh, it's not particular about its soils. Uh, and the fruit can be spread both by birds and other wildlife as well as by water. So if, the, if area floods and that uh, seed will float along and move to a new place. 
Um, Chinese tallow trees can establish really dense solid stands that crowd out our native species. Uh, it does not produce a lot of food value for animals. Uh, this is uh, one area where uh, any beekeepers amongst you might, may argue that point um, because Chinese tallow tree is, uh, for what it's worth, uh, a, a, a plant that bees do particularly enjoy. Um, but it does grow rapidly and produce a lot of seeds and again just crowd out a lot of those native species. Uh, control of popcorn trees inevitably uh, will involve uh, you know, physical removal of the tree, needing to cut it down. Um, having done that a number of times, uh, my experience is generally that after you cut them down, they are very prone to sending up shoots uh, that will need to be controlled afterwards. Uh, so uh, particularly herbicides that contain uh, triclopyr or triclopyr ester, uh, can be applied to the cut stumps to prevent them from re-sprouting after you've cut them down. Uh, and you really want to apply that as soon as you possibly can after, not, after taking the tree down uh, and really concentrate on the outer section of that stump uh, where that living tissue or cambium tissue is just inside the bark. Um, even if you do that, oftentimes you will see suckers that come up from the remaining roots. Uh, and these either need to be cut or treated with a, a foliar herbicide uh, to remove them. So uh, control of popcorn trees uh, can be a little bit of a process. And from, uh, from personal experience, uh, if you are going to cut down popcorn trees, uh, it is a, a very good idea to ensure that you do that when they don't have seed on them. Uh, because if you do that, uh, they tend to drop those seeds right where you uh, fell the tree, uh, and you will have a, a large number of seedlings coming up in that area. Uh, so you really need to make sure that you're, you're disposing of the seeds in a way uh, so they're not going to be dispersed in other areas of your landscape. Uh, they're not going to be able to germinate and produce new trees. Uh, I had a, a number of uh, popcorn trees or Chinese tallow trees uh, removed from my landscape. Uh, and one of them did have seed on it, uh, and I had to go back several times to, uh, to make sure that I had eliminated all the seedlings that were trying to come up as a result of that. Um, you can, you know, with small seedlings, you can pull them by hand before they, they reach maturity, uh, though they do tend to put down roots fairly quickly. Uh, you know, if they've come down into a grassy area, you can simply mow over that area several times. Uh, but it is a good idea also to sort of fill in the space in the landscape that's been left after the tree has been removed. Uh, and we can do that with some, some really excellent trees, uh, black gums. My personal favorite would be maples. I uh, just think that, you know, one of the reasons why people like Chinese tallow trees is that not a lot of plants down here in Mississippi really give us a lot of fall color. And Chinese tallow trees, um, do you know turn a nice reddish color in the fall uh, so i think replacing them with maple where you can get a little bit of that color uh, is kind of a natural fit for that uh, dogwoods and crepe myrtles are uh, are other options as well uh, so it wouldn't be a talk about invasive plants without mentioning kudzu uh, sometimes referred to as the vine that ate the south uh, kudzu is a perennial vine that is native to China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, has those really distinctive trifoliate leaves uh, with uh, three leaflets. Uh, each of them are quite large. Uh, and of course, it grows as a vine. And it uses stems and uh, tendrils that extend from any node on that vine uh, to attach and climb up surfaces. Uh, and if you've ever driven through uh, anywhere in the rural south, uh, it's a fairly, co fairly common sight uh, to see uh, kudzu growing on old, uh, old houses or even along power lines and other things like that. Uh, all of the nodes of kudzu uh, can root when they're exposed to soil, uh, which just further anchors the, the root to the ground and, or the vine to the ground. Uh, provides it a new place to, uh, to, uh, to move up for. Uh, and one of the things that's really significant to trying to deal with kudzu 
uh, is that roots, it, it really roots very heavily and the roots can account for about 40% of the total biomass. So uh, if you see a, a large uh, you know, planting or a large area of kudzu, uh, you could imagine you have almost as much root system underneath the ground that is uh, a part of that infestation. Uh, so kudzu was brought into the United States in 1876. It was part of the Centennial Expe Expedition in Philadelphia. Uh, it was also introduced into the Southeast in 1883 in New Orleans. Um, widely marketed as an ornamental plant, and you know it's it's not unattractive. Uh, used uh, ideally to be used to shade porches. Um, it's also distributed as a high protein uh, content cattle fodder uh, as a cover plant to prevent soil erosion um, and probably not reliable for most people, uh, but cattle will readily feed on kudzu and that, you know, if you can get them to continually eat it to the ground, that is one way uh, that you can manage small areas. Uh, by 1946, it was estimated that about 3 million acres had been planted uh, they stopped suggesting that uh, in 1953, uh, listed it as a weed in 1970. Uh, as of today, uh, and this data is a little bit old, so I'm not sure how it's expanded or, or reduced, uh, there are about 7.4 million acres of land here in the southeastern United States that are covered by kudzu. Uh, kudzu's primarily met, primary method of reproduction is asexual or vegetative reproduction. Uh, and that really is just aided by its ability to root really wherever a stem is exposed to the soil. Uh, kudzu will produce seed, uh, entirely dependent on pollinators. It does have to be pollinated. Uh, and I, I have had an experience with trying to start kudzu seed uh, and found it to be a little bit more difficult than I imagined. Uh, seed kudzu really have to uh, to go through a process in order to successfully germinate, uh, doing that in a, uh, in a laboratory setting where we're planting them in pots to, to do some research. Uh, we needed to soak the seed in acid uh, and scarify them with a nail file and a variety of other things uh, to get them to successfully germinate. So again, uh, that vegetative propagation is, is really how it spreads more than anything else. Uh, really made it a you know an attractive ornamental plant, uh, but that did uh, make it a, a serious problem as it spread throughout the southeast United States. You can see uh, a picture there of a large area covered by it. Uh, it can kill or damage other plants just by smothering it. Uh, they they just completely cover those other plants, uh, wrap entirely around tree trunks. They'll break branches from sheer weight. Um, and it will uh, grow quickly. Uh, kudzu uh, is a legume, uh, and it uh, because it is legume, it ha or uh, along with being a legume, it has the ability to uh, to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, uh, which allows it to grow in some pretty resource poor soils, uh, areas with uh, without that nitrogen availability, uh, and it can outcompete native species that don't have that ability. Uh, so there are some plants that can compete with kudzu, uh, but most of those are also invasive plants like Chinese privet or Japanese honeysuckle, uh, and we don't want to introduce a, another problem uh, to deal with this problem. Uh, just to, to go back and mention, uh, you know, control of kudzu in small areas uh, is is really going to rely on. Uh, you know, cutting the kudzu and repeated application of, of a broad spectrum herbicide like glyphosate. Uh, again, it has a really extensive root system and after you cut it, it's going to grow back. Uh, but repeated cutting can just kind of run the plant out of energy. Uh, if you have large areas using a herbicide to burn it down uh, chemically, uh, and, and then repeating that process uh, to just kind of uh, uh, eventually fight it back is, is probably the most effective thing that we're going to do in the home landscape. Uh, one plant that it's, it wasn't on our list of noxious weeds, but uh, I, I actually get a call once a year 
uh, about torpedo grass. I, I can set my calendar by it. Uh, and I, I get asked, have I come up with a way to deal with torpedo grass? Uh, unfortunately, I've not been able to answer in the affirmative yet. I, I am hopeful uh, that we come, come up with a better answer to dealing with torpedo grass. Um, it is a, a non-native uh, grass, uh, often found around streams and wetlands, but we can also find it in, uh, uh, in, in non-water-based sites. I often find it, unfortunately, in raised beds. Uh, where it can be a, a serious issue. Uh, torpedo grass gets, it, gets its name, uh, the end of the rhizome, again, that underground stem uh, or stem that runs right along the surface is, is very sharp. Uh, and if you're physically removing it, uh, do watch the ends of those rhizomes. They can be, uh, can, can be very tough and very sharp. Uh, and I would suggest using gloves. Uh, can be a problem weed in turf. Uh, it will grow in water and particularly around the edges of ponds or creeks. Uh, sometimes you hear it referred to as quack grass or bullet grass. Uh, it can grow about three foot tall, will uh, absolutely produce dense stands. Um, and again, like a lot of grasses and a lot of these invasive plants, uh, it really spreads extensively by those rhizomes, by the vegetative stage rather than sexual stage. Uh, and uh, a lot of this, you know, it, it can produce seeds. Those can be spread by water and by air. Um, if we're moving turf grass or sod from one area to another, it's possible to introduce uh, torpedo grass that way. Um, but a lot of, you know, a lot of how torpedo grass gets spread around is by us. Uh, we believe that it was introduced in the United States uh, as uh, ballast water contamination uh, or possibly for uh, introduction for forage sometime before 1876. Uh, we don't have a definitive answer on that. Um, I often get asked, you know, what the most effective way to control torpedo grass is. Uh, unfortunately, there's just not really a, a lot of effective controls for it. Um, not, you know, those uh, sort of uh, uh, non-selective herbicides like glyphosate will, uh, you know, give you some burn down or, or you know, will, will kill the top foliage, um, but it will come back from the rhizome. Uh, the areas where I've really tried to control this is in, uh, in raised beds, uh, you know, avoid excessive water because torpedo grass really does thrive in those conditions. Uh, you can physically remove the rhizome, but if you leave sections of it, uh, that will come back. So a combination of physical removal uh, and, and herbicide is, is really the best we can do for that. Uh, Chinese privet is another invasive plant that we, uh, we commonly seen or have commonly seen. Now there are several different species of privet that we have here in the United States. Uh, introduced as garden plants and as hedges. Uh, in fact, the, the top image uh, that I'm showing you there uh, is a, a hedge of Chinese privet. Uh, it was reduced, introduced around the 1950s. Um, and it can be quite challenging to tell the difference between Chinese privet and Japanese privet and the other forms. Um, it is a thicket forming shrub, uh, get up to about 30 feet tall. Uh, tends to have a lot of stems, form a really dense canopy, uh, and it grows readily for seed. It grows from root and stump uh, sprout, so after you cut it down, uh, it's very likely that it's going to sprout back. Uh, and you will see the seeds uh, eaten by wildlife uh, and birds. Uh, you can see a picture there of the seeds on the, uh, the bottom image there. Um, and you can see a, a Chinese privet that has escaped out into the wild there in that top image. Uh, control for Chinese privet is going to be very much like uh, control for popcorn trees. Uh, we are going to need to physically remove the, the top part of the plant um, and then use, uh, use triclopyr uh, as a way to prevent it from, from re-sprouting. Uh, and again, you're, you're going to wind up with some sprouts that come back from the roots or from the base of that stump. Uh, and hand pulling those or spraying a foliar herbicide can be effective in that.
Uh, if you can cut or, or mow mature plants prior to seed production, that is going to, again, similarly to the Chinese tallow tree, uh, prevent spread, you know, seed dispersal or, and plant growth. Uh, but you do need to make sure, that, you know, if you're removing them, that you treat those uh, stumps um, because it will come back fairly rapidly. Uh, so I know there are a lot of other uh, invasive plants 